sick. It's allergies. <coughs> ah. So with that, I think we'll get started. Our little saying on this uh, particular slide, a goal without a plan is just a wish. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want to have a disclaimer um, before we start much more of this, and that is I'm not an attorney, although a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of preparation will be legal in nature. My perspective comes from the fact that I have seen many individuals throughout my career in care management who have had all of their ducks in a row and have made clear exactly how they want to live out their days um, so that if they become incapable even temporarily of communicating those wishes, the plans are in place as a roadmap, if you will, for us to put together the pieces. Conversely, I have also been involved in the cases of individuals who have not put anything in writing or had those discussions with their loved ones and were left trying to pull together those pieces um, in a way that honors their wishes or what we believe to be their wishes. So my goal in speaking to you today, more importantly than anything else, is to help you to make your voice be heard and give you some tools and some resources uh, that will help you determine how to convey those to those who matter most to you. So as far as our objectives are concerned, we are looking um, to illustrate why it's important that your medical planning be made in advance and be communicated in advance. We also want to talk about why financial planning is important to us as individuals, to define the different types of directives and who you should consider for the roles of executing those directives. <clears throat> Divine, uh, define things that we consider, should consider, such as aging at home, placement options, legal matters, and support for individuals who might not have children or um, a spouse living that might be able to um, ensure that these wishes are followed for them. And lastly, we're going to come back to the importance of communicating desires and where to place those documents and how to communicate their whereabouts to the people who will later need them. So there was a national poll that was made uh, just uh, last year um, on healthy aging. And one of the questions that they um, ask of the individuals who are taking the poll is whether or not they've completed at least one of their advanced directives. Now, this population was between the age of 50 and 80 years old. And by advanced directives, we mean living will, healthcare power of attorney. In some states, a document called the PULST. Um, and we'll talk about all the unique individual pieces, but it was found that of 46% of the individuals in this study had completed at least one advance directive. 37 completed both a living will and a healthcare power of attorney. And there were 54% that did not complete, of the 54% that did not complete the advance directive, they stated the following reasons for not having done that. 62% said, well, they just really hadn't gotten around to it. And, and we've all been in a space in our lives where there are things that we'd like to get to, but they keep being put on our list for tomorrow and then for the next day and then for the day after. 15% um, said they just simply didn't know how. How do I make my wishes known? How do I choose that individual? What documents do I need? 15% um, just really were adverse to having these types of discussions around end of life and healthcare and potential incapacity. It just wasn't a pleasant topic and they opted not to have the discussion. 13% said they 
didn't think it was really necessary. And today we're going to talk about some reasons why it truly is and that it's your voice that's being conveyed in these documents. 9% said, well, nobody asked me. <laughs> and then the remaining 7% said they were deferred, deterred by cost. <clears throat> And we're going to talk as we go along about um, some ways that you can accomplish these things without cost to you. So this one I found very, very telling. So 90% of people believe that talking about the talk to talking to their loved ones about end of life care is important, but the reality is only 27% actually do it. Right? Again, we just don't get around to it. 60% of people think making sure their family is not burdened by tough decisions is extremely important, but 56% have not communicated their end of life wishes. 80% say that if they were seriously ill, they would want to talk to their doctor about end of life decisions, but sadly and unfortunately, really only 70, excuse me, 7% actually get to have this conversation. And there are a number of reasons for that that we can talk about as we go on. 82% of the population thinks that it's important to put their wishes in writing. In truth, only 23% have actually done so. So based on the statistics in this slide alone, I think it gives us a sense of how important we believe these things are versus how many opportunities that we take to actually execute them, do something about them, have those conversations. And so again, that's why this conversation today is so vitally important. So let's talk first about medical planning. Um, specifically, medical planning, most people in the industry think immediately of uh, medical power of attorney document. And I think that there are some inherent values in the medical power of attorney that I think many people don't consider until the situation has arise where they haven't had it and they've been placed in a situation where someone else had to step in sort of on the fly to be able to make these decisions. So the first thing a medical power of attorney does for you is to ensure that somebody that you actually know and trust is in charge of your healthcare decisions. And the reason this is vital to this process is that we all know that there are strengths and weaknesses of the people we love and care about. I have two perfectly wonderful, able-bodied young ladies as my, uh, as my children who I'm very proud of. One, very left brain, very deliberate, very organized. She's a rule follower um, and she's methodical in how she approaches things. She follows directions easily. My other daughter is fly by the seat of her pants is not one who's prone to convention. <laughs> She's going to look outside the box instead of inside of it. <clears throat> so I, who have very particular wishes about how my end of life or illness, even if temporary, be managed, is very well structured. And accordingly, I want someone who will follow a very um, a close set of guidelines in terms of how I want to manage that, right? So it provides permission for the designated individual to act on your behalf. So I think we've all heard a lot about HIPAA and the HIPAA privacy laws. And many of our medical institutions, albeit well-intended, um, tend to hide behind HIPAA as a means not to communicate information to family members. There is a little bit of an understanding I have because we have a very litigious society. And I think some providers are simply fearful if they put this information in the wrong hands, will there be litigation? But more importantly, it's because many of our healthcare experts don't understand that that 
HIPAA law is intended to protect us and our information. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. It avoids costly court proceedings. Um, I will tell you in the, gosh, 25 years that I've been in this industry, it's been disheartening for me the number of times where no legal documents were put in place. No one was designated as power of attorney. There were no uh, instructions in terms of living will or how things should be managed. And in some cases, there wasn't anybody clear that should be designated in, in the decision-making role. So what ends up happening is there ends up being a huge court proceeding um, whereby the judge determines who it is that's going to make decisions for you. And oftentimes that individual is likely to be a stranger who does not necessarily know how you've lived your life, where you placed your values, what things were important to you as far as your autonomy and the like. So by putting this in place, you are making sure that at very least, your wishes are going to be honored without having a court process and a stranger become involved in your day-to-day -day life. It provides family members with a great opportunity to have discussions. Um, and what I mean by that is once an individual gets the power of attorney in writing and gets the living will in writing, it's important to take that next step to have a dialogue around it so that the individuals who will be um, carrying this out for you understand your intentions right? So that if a situation occurs that they don't know exactly what you meant by something, they could, based on their understanding of your discussions, be able to at least have an educated guess about how you might want to handle a particular situation. It prevents questions about your intent, um, very similar to the last point, it just allows people to understand this is what I meant by that, um, because writing doesn't always cover all of the possible scenarios. It allows your agent, who is the person you designate, um, also called the attorney, in fact, in some cases called the power of attorney, it allows that individual to speak to other agencies and entities that are involved with providing your care. A perfect example of that would be, um, we are often hired by an adult child, a niece or nephew, a power of attorney who lives in Idaho, who can't come back into town um, to meet the needs of someone they care very much about. So they hire a geriatric care manager to be their boots on the ground to actually, you know, uh, take care of things at a local level, attending appointments, speaking with hospital staff, whatever that may be. But this gives the agent the authority to engage such services. And it really provides peace of mind for all involved. Um, it's really challenging to, uh, I'm sure many of you have had to be in the position to provide care to another individual. And the, the responsibility is awesome. And we do the best that we can to do that in, in a way that's in keeping with what you think they might have wanted. However, how many of us wouldn't like that little roadmap that says, if then, if this occurs, please do this. If I am in this situation, please do this. Um, as I said, it won't cover all possible scenarios, but I think it helps us develop an understanding of your intent as to how you wish to have care provided. I hope that makes sense. Does anybody have questions so far? Okay, Jay, we good? So far, we are perfect, Crystal. Nobody okay. has any questions so far? I always like to wait because we kind of fumble looking for our mute buttons. No, no. You can just stop me if anybody um, does have a question. 
So I want to talk a little bit more about the healthcare power of attorney. And when we talked about the issue of being able, you know, individuals thinking this was an expensive process and that it would be too costly. In Arizona, the attorney general's office has what they call the life care planning checklist. It has all of the documents that you see listed to your right. And I'm just going to move this so we can talk a little bit more about it. The life care planning checklist tells you all of the documents that you would need to consider. <clears throat> the health care power of attorney form is on there. You can either use uh, witnesses or a notary public for any of these documents. The health care power of attorney is who you designate and what authorities that you're going to give them in terms of providing for your care. The living will states how that medical treatment is provided and if there are circumstances under which you will not want heroic treatment. For example, if you were terminally ill, what would you like to do? If you stopped eating and drinking, would you want someone to be able to feed you artificially? Um, give you food and fluids artificially that gets down to the more granular level of how you wish to have things taken care of on your behalf. The mental health care power of attorney is actually unique to Arizona. So if your documents were not created in Arizona, this is something that you will want to uh, discuss with your local attorney. The mental health power of attorney allows an individual who you designate to place you in a level one behavioral health facility if you need inpatient acute treatment for things such as severe depression, severe anxiety, um, any of the mental health issues that might require treatment in a controlled environment, Without that document, in the state of Arizona, you would have to apply for legal guardianship over an individual to get them that much needed help. So it's really important part of your document. You just have to really make sure it's something you trust very much um, to take on this role. The pre-hospital medical directive, also called a DNR, or a do not resuscitate, or many people here call it the orange form because it is actually copied onto orange paper and is typically posted on your refrigerator. <clears throat> the reason that this particular document is important is that many of us have living wills that are in our homes, but if the paramedics are called to your home regarding a life and death matter, meaning you are no longer breathing, you no longer have a heartbeat, they will automatically initiate CPR, that's where they're doing the chest compressions and the breaths, to revive you unless there is something called the orange form that is posted that tells them you do not wish to have this. Now, many people say to me over the years, they've said, well, I have my living will. But as you might imagine, the, the uh, paramedics are not going to have time to find your living will and read through it. They're not going to know where it is. You may be alone in the home and not be able to direct them. So there needs to be something that they can see immediately that stands out to them that says this is an individual who would like not to be resuscitated. Now, absent this orange form in a clearly vis visible space, the paramedics will resuscitate you. And if that is your wish to be resuscitated, then that's absolutely fine. But if it is your wish that if your heart stops beating, and you stop breathing, that you not be resuscitated. You know, I personally only wanna do it once. So if I'm gone, I say I'm gone. Um, but we all have opinions about that. There's no right or wrong. Um, so it's important that these documents be in place. And as I said, you can go right to the Attorney General's website and it's a, a 
fillable packet so that you can actually do it on your computer or you can print it out um, and complete it legibly. Either way is fine. There is also a registry now, which used to be maintained by the Secretary of State's office. As of last year, um, those documents are actually now on a separate database. Um, and I'm gonna move this so that you can see the information on where those documents can be registered. And I'm referring to this area right here. You can mail it to them, you can fax it to them, you can email it to them, um, but that puts those documents for you in the registry so that if a loved one or a healthcare professional needs to access them, they can do so via that website. Are there, I know this was a lot to go through. Are there any questions on any of the things that we've just talked about? Okay, I'm gonna assume we're good. I'll keep going, but don't hesitate to stop me again. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay, let's say you were in the hospital and they said, do you wanna be resuscitated? And, um, and then you went on with your life um, and then you're in the hospital and you're at, you know, at a bad point. Um, how do you unravel all those things that you filled out in your life? So let me make sure I understand it. And is it Betty? Yes. Okay. So Betty, you're suggesting that you go into the hospital, they ask you if you want to be resuscitated and what is your response at that initial time? Well, I mean, every, I've only been in the hospital once. And then at that time they said, if something happens, do you want to be resuscitated? And I said, no. And then they went off and that was the end of that conversation. But I wondered, do they put something in the hospital records that would uh, be, you know, would apply to future visits? So I think that the, the honest answer to that is it depends. So there are some times where the doctor who's treating you for something particular and acute will say under this circumstance, under this hospitalization, she does not want to be resuscitated. I wish it was as easy as saying it only applies to that particular hospital stay because it really depends on the providers who are treating you at that time. So my honest recommendation to you, Betty, would be to address it on your own behalf on each visit if your status has changed. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, we have to self-advocate because unfortunately, otherwise it's left to systems that are highly imperfect. So um, yes, I would highly recommend that. And that's a really good question. Thanks. <laughs> Crystal, we have a question in the chat box and you've touched on this, but if you can go over it again, where do we get these documents? So um, this link that we have here is to the um, Arizona Attorney General's Office. That's the azag.gov. And from that website, you could just click on the, um, the life care planning packet. It's, thankfully, it's very, very well labeled. Any other questions that you see, Jay? Nope, that's it for now, thank you. Okay, great questions, everyone. So there are some other considerations within the healthcare space, whoops. Some other considerations within the healthcare space that I think people should strongly consider. Um, many times when I become involved in a particular individual's care, it's because there either has been very clear dialogue with family members and the individual uh, who lives geographically distant just needs some help in executing because they don't live close by. 
but there are also some times where I'm getting involved because the individual's family members don't really know what the possibilities are. And oops, is there another one in the chat? Oh, thank you, Kate. <laughs> <clears throat> So I just wanted to give you some things that all of us should be considering. The majority of the people I encounter, their first wish is to remain in their home setting. And my typical answer to that is it could be possible for absolutely anybody given the financial resources to be able to do so. Um, but I also want to consider if there is a particular agency that you prefer to work with, I have some people that have a specific hospice, for example, that they'd like to work with that, you know, that's who took care of their husband or their wife or their daughter or their parent. And so they want to make clear that that needs to be done. But by the time this time comes, I'll be honest with you, a lot of the family members don't necessarily remember who that provider was. So if you have an intention towards a, a specific home care, hospice, home health, adult day center, um, somebody who does your household maintenance, how you would want to get your meals if you didn't, uh, weren't able to cook for yourself, um, medications, um, any safety concerns that might exist for you and you know, any issues surrounding your housing. You know, I just encountered a woman who has 20 cement stairs to go up to her. And these are external stairs from her condominium to get up to the top. And um, we realized because her arthritis had gotten so bad that it was no longer an option to live in that setting. But if we modified her setting to a first floor, that she would still be able to very successfully live independently. I did add two other things to the list that I think are important. One is if you have long-term care insurance, meaning insurance that is in, uh, designed to help you pay for the cost of care in later years, then it's very, very important that you have that information available documented to those that you care about. I personally have a long-term care policy through John Hancock. And in my trust book, all of the documents for my John Hancock are right there so that when the time comes, whether it be my husband or my children, we'll be able to take that book and it has any preferences I have in it regarding any of these areas that we've talked about. One thing that I think people fail to do that's a huge part of that component is their financial advisor. The person who's going to know whether resources are going to make the things you want to do realistic and can do some cost forecasting to make sure that between your long term term care insurance and the assets that you have, perhaps a sale from your home and um, downsizing that you would be able to afford that. So our financial managers are really good at forecasting, you know, for family members to help them decide, is this realistic for you if the day comes when you can no longer even temporarily speak on your own behalf? And I consider uh, the, the things in the last two slides being the greatest gift that you can give your loved ones who will come after you to fulfill all of your wishes because you don't want them focusing on where do I find, where do I find, where do I find? You want them focusing on the care you so richly need and deserve. So the more we can do our pre-planning, the better off the individuals who are going to execute that beautiful plan of yours um, are going to be able to do so in, in a manner that you would be happy with. So let's go to the right hand column and talk about if your plan is to move to a supportive setting. I will honestly tell you that if I have the chance, 
uh, to move to a supportive setting where I can get three square meals a day, lots of activities, independent living. I'm all about it. My kids won't have to convince me I'm in. Uh, I don't want to clean for myself and I don't want to cook for myself when the day comes that I no longer have to. So if you are me, <laughs> and you have those thoughts of going to some place where it's just you're having fun all day and cocktails with your friend in the evening and uh, then head to your slumber without a care in the world, um, then start looking at some of these places, the independent livings. A lot of them have additional services that can help you stay in those environments longer because they offer some sort of home care component that you can use as needed in that setting. For assisted living, the world has really grown in terms of the quality, the finishes, the care that you can get in an assisted living, but only you are going to know what place checks off all those boxes. So I often recommend to people in advance of need, start looking around, ask your friends when they move into these places, get a sense of which ones are comparable and, and consistent with the way you would want to live your life. Um, same with memory care. Um, when that time comes where an individual is unable to recognize danger or summon assistance, it's really important as early as you can to involve them in a plan that helps them select that place that might be their place. It may not be that exact place, but they can say, oh, I love the activities here. I love the amenities here. I love the size of the rooms here. Arm the people that you love with enough information so that they can translate that into an appropriate setting that you yourself might have chosen if, uh, if circumstances were different. Skilled nursing, the very same thing. The majority of care can be met in the assisted living and the memory care environment, but there are circumstances under which an individual might need a more skilled care, such as uh, tube feedings, where you're being fed uh, through a tube in your stomach. Those can't be managed in the assisted living environment because quite frankly, they're not even required to have a nurse. And in those settings, it would be really important to have that level of expertise. Again, regardless of the column that you choose to follow, and maybe it's column A in the beginning, and maybe at a certain point when your financial forecast changes, it turns into column B, but your long-term care insurance can provide an extended life in whatever setting you choose. Um, and, you know, don't think for certain that you, you can't get long-term care insurance still. Um, there are many policies that will, you know, accept uh, people of a certain number of birthdays, um, but you'll have to ask the experts about that, and um, I can give you a referral source for that if, if you need that. Okay, any questions? I know this was a whole lot of information. Kate. Hi, I forgot uh, to, to mention the fact that I had to step out for a moment. So if I missed this, please forgive me if I am repeating. But I actually sent a friend of mine who uh, is without a partner, her family are out of state. She's recently disabled. I had her download those forms and she went off to her bank to have them signed. And the, the people at the bank said that they would not um, act as her witness. And more and more organizations I hear are doing that same thing. There's a notary public there, but you need that witness. And it was during the pandemic and she couldn't get a person. So it, when it comes to finding that notary who's willing to sign forms that are essentially saying at the moment you sign them that you are competent, I think that's the thing that hangs up. Um, who would you suggest for uh, getting that notary? So there are a number of mobile notaries that are here within the Valley. Um, I, of course, my brain is locking up about one in particular right now um, that I can think of. Uh, hmm. 
gosh, I've had people even at the UPS stores or the FedEx stores that get them. You know, you're not saying that this individual, you know, you're not answering a capacity question. You're asking whether or not this individual has knowledge of what they're signing and they're signing it of their free will. So I don't know if that's more bank policy that would get in the way, but I've never had any difficulty with anyone going to a UPS store, FedEx store. They all have notaries now. And I'd be surprised if you'd have any pushback there. Now, if somebody walks in who has questionable capacity, that's a whole different um, ball of wax. But in likelihood, they wouldn't be bringing these prepared documents into a notary's office. So, yeah, banks um, have gotten really, really careful on a number of issues. Uh, financial powers of attorney as well. They uh, require it to go through their legal department. And there's a whole lot. So, I would likely avoid a bank as where I would go for um, notarization. I think it's their policy more than it is um, the actual act of notarizing. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we have a, um, a few more questions. How would I get a geriatric care manager? And are geriatric care managers similar to social workers? If so, in what way? Okay, now these are great questions. And if you can hold on, Jocelyn, for uh, one or two more slides, I think I'm going to get you there and answer that question. <laughs> I okay, think it's the next thank one. you. You're welcome. Ah, here we go. You didn't have to wait long, Jocelyn. Okay, so resources um, for health care um, considerations. If an individual's remaining at home, very often, um, it's going to be important to have some support around that decision to remain at home. And a geriatric care manager and or a fiduciary, and I'm going to explain the, the differences between the two here shortly, a geriatric care manager can consider them the person holding your health care roadmap, right? So the goal of the care manager is to coordinate your care, to make sure that you have all the right services in your home, and to make sure as the need for services change, we're helping you to adapt and revise your plans in that home care setting to meet the changing needs. In addition to that, we are, when our clients, and I can only speak for geriatric resources, my company, um, because not every care management company does this, but if our clients go to the emergency room, we go with them and we stay with them until they're admitted or, dis or discharged. And I'll tell you why that's an important factor to me. We are never at our best when we arrive in the emergency room, right? There's a reason that we landed there, correct? So typically we aren't feeling our best. We can't necessarily answer the questions that they might be asking with the same clarity we might if we were feeling 100%. Um, we have a medication list, a list of diagnosis, a face sheet, all of the um, demographic information for our clients, as well as any legal documents that exist for them. So when we're arriving there, we have copies of their insurance cards, you don't have to worry about anything because sometimes the paramedics don't even give you a chance to take your purse. And if you're not of, of mind to think of that at that point, because you're feeling so poorly, you want an advocate to arrive there. I find that we also help process clients through the care they need a lot faster. And if you've ever been to the hospital and then you've gone and, and been admitted to the floor, it's like you drove across town to a whole different hospital. You're having to tell the same things again. The documents that you gave to the people downstairs uh, somehow have vanished into a vortex while you were on your way up the elevator. And so you're having to give that same report. Again, you're not feeling well. And so, you know, same with discharge planning to help you get clarity. Do you need a caregiver perhaps to come and stay with you for the first 24 hours? Have you been so physically depleted that you're at risk for falling, et cetera? So there are many ways in which a care manager can act. 
And Jocelyn, in answer to your question, it's like a social worker uh, meets a dog walker meets a medical advocate. It's, it's, you know, to our clients, we're whatever they need us to be in order to live a healthy and constructive life on their own terms. Now, a fiduciary is more often than not assigned by the courts and they would come in in those situations where individuals don't have a party that can be designated. And the courts may say, this individual is now incapacitated and needs a guardian who will make decisions about their person and or a conservator who will make decisions about their finances or their assets. Now, an individual can also choose to hire a fiduciary in advance. So say, for example, you don't have children or your children live out of the state or out of the country and have children of their own and they have um, jobs of their own and they're just, they just can't take on an additional responsibility. You can ask that a fiduciary become power of attorney for you, both on the healthcare side and the finance side. And you can do that well in advance and communicate to that individual, again, using your living will, your pre-hospital medical directive, and any other documents that you would like to give them a roadmap as to how you wish to live your life if even temporarily you're unable to speak for yourself, right? Again, your financial advisor is gonna be a huge part of that because they're gonna to help to forecast how feasible the option of remaining in the home is. And as far as your long-term care insurance, it's going to preserve your assets by utilizing those services that are available within your policy. And each policy is so completely different. I've seen everything from a lifetime policy that, you know, pays out um, with a rider for inflation so that as inflation increases, it increases. I've seen policies that were done many, many years ago and are for $100 a day and it never goes up. Um, there are so many scenarios. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I love to do is help people figure out what services they have on their long-term care insurance policy. So I would be happy um, to help anybody who's looking for assistance in that area. The last question that Jocelyn asked that I wanted to uh, make sure that I didn't forget to mention is how to find a geriatric care manager. And there is a website called aginglifecare.org. And on that, you can find an aging life care professional, also called the geriatric care manager, anywhere in the country. So Kate, can I have you put that in the chat so that everybody has it? Aginglifecare.org. And again, you can find a, a, a care manager anywhere in the country using that site. Oops. So if an individual is going to move to a supportive setting, I think it's really important to um, have a placement agent um, that you trust that can help you sort of find your place. And placement agents um, are paid for by the facility you ultimately choose to move into. And so it's very important to look at um, which placement agency you use. There are some very trusted ones and I'll share with you Benavia Cares Program and some of the providers that they have um, because many of these resources are going to be right at your fingertips. So we'll talk about that towards the end. But the placement agent can help you based on what geographic area you'd like to be in, coupled with what your budget is, coupled with what the finishes are, what size apartment you would like, what amenities you would like to see. And they can put that all together and narrow down the list. 
because for many of us, we have there's no certificate of need required to build a healthcare facility in the state of Arizona. So you could be really peddling uh, for a long time just to find that just right facility. And in the meantime, you may encounter a number of facilities that don't suit your needs at all, which results in some wasted time. So I think it's really important that uh, people team up with the placement agencies. And again, I'll help you find those. Um, that's the you are not alone part. We're, we're almost there. <laughs> um, a real estate agent. I think it's important to, you know, call on your friends and your family members who have had good experience with realtors. Um, we have one we use because he's like Mr. One Stop Shop and he takes care of everything. We've had families that didn't even have to come into state to help have him help them uh, with that process. So again, the more you can think about the better. I think a really important, and this should have probably been in both uh, areas, not probably, it should have been estate planning, really sitting down with an attorney and talking about what would be important um, for you to be able to keep your assets from having to go through probate and some of the other things we'll talk about coming up here really quick. And movers. <clears throat> I am a stickler for people taking good care of my belongings. And so a referral to a mover uh, is worth its weight in gold to me. So again, ask those people around you. And um, once you've decided on you know, the, the resources that you like, really start to compile that list for those that you care about and who will end up executing your plans in the long run. So financial planning, um, I think the really important thing that we need to know here is that in medical planning, there are some med, uh, surrogate decision makers that folks can default to if there is no legal document in place. For example, a husband for a wife and then an adult child would be next in line. And then, um, uh, uh, a sibling would be next in line. And it kind of goes on in terms of the people who can substitute their judgment for yours with regards to healthcare. But financial is a completely different ball of wax. There is no default authority. There is no sur surrogate decision-making. It is either in place that you have a power of attorney or it is not in place that you have a power of attorney. In this situation, a very extensive and lengthy legal process is likely in your future if there isn't something, which may include probate. So some people say, well, I have my daughter on my account. And for most people, that works out to be a fine arrangement. And again, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not a lawyer. I am speaking from what I have seen over the years. And one of the things is once that individual is added to your bank account, for all intents and purposes, that money belongs to both of you. So if there is an unfortunate situation where one of the people you put in your on your account ends up involved in a bankruptcy, then you've also now dragged yourself into that bankruptcy or at least a portion of the funds that are in that account. So I really think that this is an important factor that everybody should consider. Okay. In 2011, after browbeating my husband for months, I finally was able to convince him of the wisdom of having a trust. In fact, I convinced him of the wisdom of talking about any of this. My husband was one of those individuals that said, why do we have to talk about this? It's morbid. It's awful. You know, why do we have to do this? Things will just take care of themselves. And I finally got through to him when I said to him, our children, you know, we travel together pretty much every time we go on vacation, every time we get in a plane, every time we get in a car. 
and we travel together. And what would we leave for our children to have to sort through? Would it be probate, trying to find all our accounts, um, trying to find out our vehicles are titled? You know, have any of you ever tried to change any information on your cable and your the spouse of the individual who has cable? I mean, just something as simple as changing the cable, if you're not the one whose name is on the account, can be overwhelming and difficult. So I say to people, the more planning that we can do, the more we can put in place for ourselves and the individuals who follow us. Now, every vehicle we purchase is titled in the name of our trust. Every bank account is titled in the name of our trust. The trust is our beneficiary. Um, the trust acts as its own individual entity, right? So there are significant benefits that trust is actually a separate entity from us. And if you haven't talked to an attorney about the possibility of creating a trust, I highly recommend that this is a good step for you. Um, my trust happens to include the power of attorney, the living will for both of us, our trust, our last will and testament, um, all of those things are, are included, but also included our instructions as to how our trust is to be administered. What happens when one of us passes away? What happens when the second one passes away? Who takes over and what are their instructions as to where to find everything and how to, to work it? So if you haven't thought about creating a trust, I think it's a very good idea. Um, to look into it. There are elder law attorneys, uh, one in particular that we'll talk about here that is part of the Benavides Care Program. So here's the you are not alone part. So I happen to be um, a CARES partner. CARES is a resource um, uh, community, why couldn't I find the word, sorry. It's a resource community for individuals to be able to come and find a one-stop shop for the, for the services that are most needed by their constituents. So if you go to the benavia.org uh, website and you go to the CARES program, the community resources, you would see a screen that looks much like the one in front of us. As you can see the categories, assisted living, independent living, fiduciary services, geriatric care management, home care, hospice, legal, senior placement, skilled nursing facilities and memory care communities. So many of the things that we talked about that would be in consideration for you have already been vetted by the folks at Benavia and have them on their website. Uh, Laura Johnson happens to specifically be an estate planning attorney. Um, and I, I feel comfortable in telling you that she did my estate documents and, and those of many of our clients. Um, you're never too young, you're never too old uh, to, to think about this sort of planning. Um, I think it does uh, make it a lot easier for the people that you love um, to try to figure things out in the end. And I'm telling you, there's not a time that goes by when I see her that she doesn't bring up something that I had never considered about my individual circumstances that she could put protections behind by updating our trust. So, um, these are all resources available to you. I think it's important to know that you are not alone. Many of us provide complimentary consultations. You know, if it's, if it's just a referral that we can make to you, we're more than happy to do that. If it's care management that you need, we're more than happy to do that as well. But we are here for our community uh, every bit as much as we are for individuals who are paying for our services. So let's just kind of pull things together by get, just giving you some, some things that you might consider. Who will you trust to manage your health care? Now, as you consider that, I would consider that 
I would never choose my best friend, Charlotte. And the reason I would never choose her is that she would plug me in a light socket if that's what it meant to keep me around. And that's not consistent with my wishes. So as you think about the specifications of what you want in your health care, make sure that the individual that you task with responsibility for that area of your life is up to the task and will respond in a way that's consistent with your wishes, right? For example, my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, as I told you, she colors outside of the lines. Um, uh, she's free with her money. She would not be my financial power of attorney. Um, I, would, I would absolutely have her be my personal caregiver in 100% of the times because she's gonna make sure I have on lipstick and my nails are trimmed nicely. Um, but when it comes to those other aspects, it's going to be my oldest daughter, right? Also, what specifications do you want regarding your health care? How will you lay this all out so that people can make choices for you that would be consistent with the choices that you would make for yourself? Who would you trust managing your finances? And if there isn't somebody who has strength in that particular skill set that you know, or that just necessarily isn't the good fit for whatever reason, is it time to consider a fiduciary and put those in place for the future? That might be a consideration. Um, what specifically will they need to know regarding your finances? Do you have an investment individual who knows from soup to nuts what your financial portfolio will look like and can help with that forecasting piece of things as you begin to utilize care? Do you have long-term care insurance? Are you at the point where you can make claim on that insurance policy? And that's something that our organization helps with as well. You may still qualify for long-term care insurance. Um, and so if it's something that you're looking into, um, an insurance broker is your best bet because that individual will have access to multiple different policies across many different companies rather than just being able to share with you the policies provided by just the company they work for, if that makes sense. Um, so I would always go to a broker when I'm looking for that. And if, you're, if your wishes aren't documented clearly in a legal format, why not? Why not today? Right? Any questions? There is no question too silly. You know what, I'm gonna break the ice here, Crystal. Okay. Um, I, I have a question in regards to trusts. If you have a, um, a financial setup, like say a, um, an investment account or something, where you already have designated beneficiaries, do you need to add that particular item to your trust? Is, that, is it more efficient to do it that way or? So it, it, the, the good news is that if an individual has a trust, I always put the trust as the beneficiary because then the trustee will just administer the trust as it should be. Whereas if someone happens to pass away that you've listed as a beneficiary or God forbid you fall out of favor or that person falls out of favor with you and you forget to change it, you still owe that person. And so, you know, definitely consult your uh, attorney, but I personally, and in all of our dealings, our trust is our beneficiary. Fantastic. Not that we intend to fall out of favor with anyone or that I have, but I'm, I'm one of those who prepares for the worst case scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Sure. Now, don't be bashful out there, folks. This is our chance to get our questions answered and make sure we, uh, like you said earlier, Crystal, uh, 
there's no better time than now to start doing this if we haven't. Mm -hmm. And I, I can feel for that because I just reached Social Security age myself. <laughs> yeah. It sneaks up on us, doesn't it? Too quickly. And if you're too shy to ask the question, you're welcome to put it in the chat. We don't bite. With that? I said, we don't bite. No. Nope. Uh, At least not today. <laughs> I, I guess my question is, um, um, I am facilitating a, a support group. Oh. And is this being recorded? And is it something that I could share with well, my group somehow? Tony, thank you very much for that. And you kind of stole my wrap up thunder, but that is, okay. <laughs> but I'll go ahead right now and let everybody know. Yes, this, this is being recorded the entire presentation. And what we will do is once we're finished up and it'll take about 24 to 48 hours to edit this, because obviously I was on earlier doing some logistics with Crystal, but we will edit the entire video and then place it on our Benavia YouTube channel. And you can look that up, just Google Benavia YouTube channel, or it's just on our playlist, which is the educational workshops. And there's probably about 40 different videos on there right now. And if Crystal's okay with that, we will take the um, PowerPoint presentation as well, and we'll turn that into a short video and place that on YouTube for you. So. At your convenience, you can go back at any time and, and watch both of them. Oh, and my great. contact information is here. If anybody had specific questions that you're not uh, comfortable asking with the group or it's a very uh, specific set of circumstances you want to discuss, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yes, this would be great. Super. And Jay, there will be a survey also, correct? Yes, I was sending out a short survey. It's only about 10 questions, take you about two minutes. And it just helps us gauge how well we did today. And it makes each and every workshop in the future a little bit better. We're trying to focus these on exactly what uh, you folks are looking for and how we can benefit you with this information. I have a question. Oh, sure. Uh, can can Bill, Ben Avila recommend long-term insurance companies or a trusted long-term insurance company? So, you know, it's probably going to be different for every individual because it's going to be based on your circumstances, your age, your health history. But I do have someone that I can recommend to you that's a broker um, that has done very, very good work um, for our clients in the past. Oops. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put that in the chat for you, Jocelyn. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanna follow up that as well, Crystal. Um, I'm gonna make the suggestion to call our CARES program. Um, wow. our, our resource specialists are there, it's, it's free. There's absolutely no charge for that. And above and beyond what Crystal talked about is our, our our partners, our sustaining partners, which Crystal is. Um, these are folks that have been vetted. We've worked with for a long time. They're amazing. As you can tell by Crystal's presentation today, they're amazing people. Uh, their heart is only with the people that they can help. So, you know, we completely appreciate that. But if it's something we don't work directly with our partners with and something like insurance, um, we do have about a thousand other resources we work with locally that folks have questions maybe about real estate or maybe about, you know, just something as simple as um, a handyman service or something like that. Our CARES people deal with them every day. So uh, just mm -hmm. give them a shout at our main number and they'll be the folks to be able to direct you in the right, uh, right area. Oh, okay. Thank you. Just an FYI, I have uh, used the CARES uh, resources and been very happy with what I have found. Oh, that's very nice. Well, thank you, Tony. Oh, we appreciate oh, that endorsement. I, I, hope, 
That's a, that is our plan. You know, <laughs> our, our mission at Benavia is to keep everybody independent at home as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And we hear something like that. It makes us realize, you know, we're doing the right thing. So thank you. Amen. Betty, were you going to say something? I had a question. Sure. <laughs> um, I, what I wonder about is for the people that maybe don't have children, don't have the obvious mm -hmm. um, choices for these forms, um, going to an attorney, they don't seem really, uh, they want to just plug in the information in a format. Um, so where, where, what would be a kind of a, uh, first step, second step of putting your plan together? Would it be coming to someone like you to figure out the plan that you're going to ask the attorney to um, implement or, you know, uh, advise you on? Right. Or where, who would that be? So for me, I feel the estate planning attorneys, if you're going to a good one, they are going to prompt you in the areas that you need to, to mm -hmm. ask questions or have the answers. Um, so, and most of them do give a complimentary consultation to just kind of get a sense of what direction you need to go and to help you um, in that endeavor. I would strongly encourage you if you've not already, uh, uh, Johnson and Associates is a really good law firm and I, they brought up things that I had not even considered and I've been, you know, in this industry for 30 years. Um, so I think somebody who's an expert in specifically estate law and elder law um, is going to help walk you through that. Okay, thank you. Did I answer your question entirely, Betty? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. These are great questions. Keep them coming. Where is the website um, where we can get the forms, like the, the living will and the um, durable power of attorney? So those are on the attorney uh, general's website. The A, so AZ as in Arizona, AG as an attorney general. Okay, yeah. that's dot org or dot com. Let me go back. Com. Whoops. I get a little ahead of myself. Dot gov. Dot gov. Okay. Thank you. All right, do we have any other questions? Well, I can't thank you all enough for giving me of your time. And um, please do, if there's anything that I can answer for you beyond this or any help or support I can give you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, the CARES program does a wonderful job of answering questions. We work with them an awful lot. Um, and so uh, please utilize us. That's what we're all here for. Excellent. Well, I wanna say thank, thank you, you again, Crystal. That was an amazing presentation. Um, just bullet pointed and easy to follow. I think uh, I think we touched a lot of people today with the information that they needed. So thank you so much. And thanks for being a, a partner with us at Benavia. We appreciate that. It's an honor. Um, once again, I just want to let everybody know that we will have this as a video on our YouTube channel. And uh, we'll also have the PowerPoint presentation. So I'll be posting that out. So look for an email, just like you've been getting with the link to this presentation from me in the next day or so. We'll get that out to you. And if you could be kind enough to send us a, you know, take a couple minutes and do the little survey. It's very easy to follow. It's just clicking through. We try to make it as simple as possible. So we do these once or twice a month throughout the year. And hopefully someday in our future, we'll get to do them again in three dimensions where we're all in person <laughs> rather than on a, a video screen. But um, our next, uh, educational workshop coming up will be March 30th at 1.30. And the title of that particular 
workshop is threats to your family's financial future. So they're going to be talking about estate planning and VA planning and will planning, all the nuts and bolts from a financial aspect. So uh, I think that goes very well and hand in hand with what Crystal talked about today. So amazing. So hopefully we'll see you then. The signups are on benavia.org, our website. If you have any questions or you don't know where to turn, or if you're just looking for Crystal's number again, uh, looking for a hand, just give us a shout. Our number at Benavia is 623-584-4999, and we will get you headed in the right direction. So thank you for joining us, everybody, today. Crystal, thank you. And Kate, thank you for being in the background with us and supporting our presentation today. We hope to see you all soon. Go outside and enjoy the rain now. And it's <laughs> we'll have some fun. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Crystal. You're thank so you. welcome.